Today we're going to look at something called z-scores. Last time we looked at something called the mean and we looked at um, standard deviation as a way of trying to compare sets of data. Trying to say, well, this set of data and this set of data are perhaps similar in that they have the same average or the same mean, but one set might be quite spread out and another set might be more compacted. So with those two um, statistics, we can tell a lot. But let me give you an example where we might want to pursue another uh, way of comparing sets of data that might be very interesting to us. Suppose, for example, we had somebody and he got 80% on two tests. Well, that sounds pretty good. Not too bad at all. I mean, you might be pretty proud of that. But let's say in one of the classes, let's say class A, scored 80% all right, but we also happen to know that the class average was 74. And the spread of the data, the deviation, was four units. Okay, so gives us a little bit more information. And let's look at the other class. Well, class B, <clears throat> the average might be 72, so a little bit lower, but the mean, or uh, sorry, the deviation was nine, so it's a little bit more spread out. Now, this kind of data is very easy to compile. If you think about it, if you were the teacher and you had, say, 30 students, so you had N um, as, a, as a sample um, of your sample, there were N um, data entries, and N being 30, you would simply work out the average or the mean, and you could easily work out the deviation. Most of that you would do on your calculator. And uh, same thing here with... Uh, with this class, you would have, well, I don't know, maybe there's 26 students, so n would be 26, and you would work out the average or the mean and the deviation. And so that would be very easy to calculate these statistics. But what does it tell us? I mean, for this person, which class do you think they really did better in? I mean, they scored the same percentage in both classes. But maybe in one of the classes, and I'll just give you an extreme here to sort of see where I'm coming from. <clears throat> Imagine in one of the classes, um, the average mark was 90%. And getting 80% might be really, really low. Okay, Still 80%, but it might be really at the bottom of the class. Maybe in the other class, the average was 70%, and getting 80% is a really outstanding achievement. How do you know? Well, that's where this stuff comes in. So we're going to develop something here called finding the z-scores. And the z-scores is a way of comparing um, when you have means and deviation. And you wonder, well, where does this fit in? Way of comparing. So let me just show you with class A how we would do that. We're going to take this 80% score and say, well, how far away is that from the class average? So we'll subtract 74. So we're finding the distance away from the mean. In this case, it's a positive distance because we're above the mean. We're going to take that distance and say, well, how many deviations is that above average? How many standard deviations have you gone past the average? So we take the, the deviation, 4, and we divide by it. So when I work this out, I get 1.5. So what this means is that we're one and a half deviations above average. So that tells you that this in this class, he was, or she, was quite a bit better than average. Now, in class B, and I think I might just be able to cram this down here. Class B, I'm going to do the same thing. We have a score of 80 minus the average, so we're finding the distance above the average, and then we divide by the deviation. See how many deviations above average we are. Well, I did this in advance and I got 0 0.89, so not even one deviation above average. So in which class did he actually or she do better and should be prouder?
class A, because considerably farther above average. Now, these calculations I just did here are called the Z-score. Let me just show you what the formula looks like for calculating Z-scores. Really nice way to take data from all kinds of different situations. You, all you have to do is find the deviation and find out what the class average was, and you can sort of see how a student would, would be compared to uh, the class. So it gives you a pretty good idea. So to calculate a Z-score, what we do is we take um, the, uh, the mark or, or whatever the data entry that we're looking at, which we're going to call X. We subtract the average, and we divide by the deviation. And it basically tells us how many times, uh, how many deviations above or sometimes below the average we are. Now, the nice thing about the Z-score is that if you're smack dab on average, okay, then what you're going to do there is get a Z-score of zero, which means you've done, you've achieved the exact average. And if we have a Z-score that's positive, that means that we're above the average. And if we have a Z-score that's negative, that means that we're below the average. So it, it gives us a lot of information, and as I say, a great way of comparing from um, one class to the next class. And so 80% might mean many different things, but this gives us a much better idea of um, how, what kind of an achievement really that 80% might mean in one given class. Okay, well, if we take Z-scores, we could go ahead and graph these kinds of things. And um, basically where I'm going now is with something that we call a normal distribution. And uh, many things, many, many things are what we call normally distributed or what we often refer to as the bell curve. So let me just talk a little bit about the normal, oops, the normal distribution. And what a normal distribution uh, might look like is something like this. Let's take um, in Canada here um, the heights of Canadians. Well, if you think about heights, if you were able to, you could figure out the average height of Canadians. We would take 30 million or however many um, samples that we have, we'd average them out, and we'd have some kind of a average. And we would find that average might be, oh, whatever that might correspond to, maybe a 5 foot 10 or something, 5 foot 8. Then as we look to the right, we would find above average, well, how many Canadians are above average? Well, just slightly above average would be probably quite a few, and a little bit more um, uh, above average, a little bit higher than the average Canadian. Well, there's probably less of those and so on and so forth. So we'll probably get a shape that looks something like this. Okay? It doesn't ever end because technically we can't ever say, well, this is it. Nobody ever gets higher than seven foot four or something like that. Technically, could be somebody born next year that'll grow to be seven foot five. So it, it does continue. And the same thing if we look at it from this side. We'll find that there are fewer and fewer people who get smaller and smaller and smaller. Fewer and fewer heights that are away from the average. Most heights of Canadians would be clustered around the average. So we get this kind of bell curve shape. And so this is what we call uh, the normal distribution. It has a mean, an average, and we have certain amount of things that are above average, and a kind of symmetrical or balanced amount of things that are below average. Now, this could apply to something like heights of people. Um, when we measure uh, intelligence using an IQ test uh, method, for example, you would probably have 
an average intelligence, and you will have people that are slightly above average, and then fewer and fewer people that are higher and higher above that average, and the same thing on the downside of that, below average. Um, we could take um, ages of people. Okay, we might find that uh, there's an average age of uh, whatever Canadians or uh, people in um, Vancouver or something, and there are fewer and fewer people that are above that age, and as we get higher and higher above that age, there's fewer and fewer. Same thing on the left. And we can go on and on. Now, what about um, our normal distribution? Well, most of the time, what we do is we don't say that this number here corresponds to a, a height or it corresponds to a certain intelligence, although we could graph it that way. What we usually do is put the probability um, that uh, you're going to um, take a person and that they will have that average height. For example, um, maybe we would say uh, this corresponds to 0.2 probability. Well, what that means is that um, this particular average, you would have a 20% probability that uh, if you randomly selected a person, 20% probability that that person has the average height. So we usually use probability. Probability can also be thought of in terms of percentage. That's usually the way the y-axis part of our graph works. Um, another thing about this is that it's symmetrical. Now, what does that mean? It means that if we take this line here, we've got the same shape on the right as we have on the left. Okay, It's a very balanced distribution. Um, the other thing uh, that we could say about this, this is very different from the distribution uh, that we looked at with the binomial expansion. And I'll just make a little bit of room here. We don't need this anymore. But if we think of the um, a binomial experiment where we had success or failure, we think of shooting the basketball, for example, a number of times, um, that was what we call a discrete distribution. And it's discrete because you have, for example, zero successes. Perhaps you have one success two successes, and let's just say a person took three shots at the foul line, you could have as many as three out of three successes. <clears throat> so depending upon how good the player is and the probability of success, you might have a distribution that looks something like this. Okay. Now, this is called a discrete distribution because there really is no possibility for numbers other than these whole numbers here. You can't talk about, well, what's the probability of him shooting these three, taking these three shots and getting 2.2 successes? Well, you don't really, you can't really visualize that. It's, it's very much uh, separate numbers, whole numbers. This, on the other hand, if we look at the, um, the example that I started with when I talked about heights of Canadians, well, suppose the average height was something like um, 5 foot uh, 8 inches. Okay, and that was our average, our mean. Well, I mean, you're going to go just slightly to the right of that, and you're going to have somebody who's 5 foot 8 and the tiniest little smidgen. Okay, and then you're going to have 5 foot 8 and a little bit bigger smidgen. You, you have everything in between. I mean, somewhere in this big country, we're going to find somebody who's five foot eight and a smidgen less than that guy, but a smidgen more than five foot eight and so on. So this kind of a distribution is what we call continuous. We can talk about all the little numbers and the little decimals in between, and they do make sense. We can talk about probabilities that correspond to someone who's 5 foot 8 inches, 0.1, whatever units you want to use. But we can talk about finding those probabilities. So that's very different um, being a continuous distribution to our binomial type distributions, which are discrete. So... Um, that's pretty much the, um, the situation with the normal distribution. That kind of tells you a little bit about um, uh, what kind of distribution we're looking at. Um, one of the most useful distributions of the, of the normal distribution family 
let's say we had uh, this set of data here might be representing, um, if we use the uh, class exam, class A, there's their average, and that's the, the spread of the data. And um, suppose we had another one that uh, might have a mean somewhere over here, and we've got uh, data perhaps more spread out, something like that. Um, what we would like to do, which is what we did earlier when we found those z-scores, that's called um, putting them in a standard normal distribution. So um, the following is so that we can compare class A to class B and look at it in terms of a normal distribution that's not shifted all over the board with different averages and different amounts of spread, but we standardize it into the standard normal distribution. And again, what that meant was you take, uh, instead of saying that the mean is 74 with a deviation of whatever it is, uh, and this person might have scored 80, which would be somewhere over here, and, and working sort of off the mark like that, we use a standard normal distribution, i.e. we calculate and use z-scores and graph those. We get a graph that's also a normal distribution, but it has the following desirable qualities. Okay. The mean is at zero. So that's really nice. And we saw that with our opening example. Um, when we found the z-score, I mentioned, well, what if you got the class average? Then your z-score would be the, your mark, which would be class average, minus the mean, and result in a z-score of zero. So we have a... Um, a mean of zero, and further to that, to be a standard normal, so I'm going to just jot that over here, the mean is zero, the deviation is one, which is really nice. It makes it very easy to compare. Uh, so if somebody got a z-score of two, we know that's two deviations above the mean, and if somebody got a z-score of one, that would be one deviation above the mean, and so on and so forth. So the standard normal distribution is really a nice way of taking um, normal distributions that could be all over and putting them into a nice com comparable format. All right, well, uh, let's look at some examples how we would use this kind of a distribution to answer some questions, do some probabilities. So I'm going to do some examples now, and, and there's um, oh, different ways you can do these on calculators. Um, most of which are quite user-friendly. So it's actually lots of fun stuff. So let's look at an example here. In this first one, we're going to look at light bulbs. And of course, if you've had any experience with light bulbs, what do we know? Well, sometimes they go poof, broken. So they have a limited lifespan. So perhaps we did some studies and we got a sample maybe of a thousand light bulbs and we turned them all on and we timed how long each one lives, and we came up with, well, there's a mean amount of hours for this particular brand of light bulb. And we might find that that's 98 hours. Okay, And then we worked out, since it's easy to do, we worked out what the standard deviation is. We found that that came to about 13 hours. Okay, well, let's um, ask some questions here. Like, um, let's start off and say, well, what percent of light bulbs, what percent falls between 72, 72 and um, 124 hours? So in other words, you might ask yourself, um, if I thought 72 hours was a pretty reasonable length for a light bulb, and I thought, wow, as far as 124, that's really just optimal. If we have light bulbs that fall between that, we might really say that's good stuff. Well, for this manufacturer, they might want to know, well, what percentage of the manufactured light bulbs falls between these different uh, amount of hours? Now, whenever I work on a problem like this, I really think uh, the best approach is that you draw yourself a little distribution. And you say, okay, um, this is a normal distribution. 
And I didn't bother to uh, write that up here, but usually somewhere in the question it'll say that the life of the light bulb is normally distributed. So they kind of like to tell you that, because otherwise how would you know? Probably wouldn't. So what do we know here? Well, the mean, okay, smack dab in the middle, is 98. Okay. And the deviation is 13, but that, that we'll worry about in a moment. What they want to know is what percentage falls between 72, okay, so 72, somewhere over here, and 124, so somewhere over here. Okay, so what percentage is this area here, this shaded area, is what percent? Now, of course, the way probability distributions work, um, what we're going to get is not the percent, we're going to get the probability contained between 72 and 124, but all you have to do is times that by 100, and you convert that to a handy percent. So we're going to try and figure out the probability that's represented from here up to there. How do we do it? It's very easy on most calculators. On the TI-83, here's kind of the format. Uh, you would first of all go to second function and press VARS. And pressing those two buttons uh, gets you in the world of distributions. And uh, once you're in the world of distributions, you look for this one. You look for normal, because we are dealing with normal distributions. And we want to have a cumulative quantity here. So we choose normal CDF. And this means cumulative density function. Here's another little tip. We pretty much never use a normal PDF for anything, okay? I mean, there are uses for it in many other applications, but as far as what we're doing here, we're always going to use normal CDF. Now, you'll notice that that's different from the binomial stuff we did. Binomial, you use PDF, and sometimes you use CDF. So you got to make sure that, you know, well, if it's binomial, it could be one or the other, but with normal, it's just... It's always going to be CDF. So here's what you want to put down now. Normal CDF. How do we answer this question? Well, it's so simple, you will laugh. <clears throat> ha -ha. Start with your lower boundary, 72. Then you go to your upper boundary, 124. And then you put in your mean, which is 98. And you put in your deviation, and you hit enter. Isn't that simple? Kind of fun, actually. So what do you get? Well, I did this, and I got 0 0.95, and there was a 4.5. So as a percent, you would write 95, and we could round that or just leave it to two decimal places, 95.45%. That's how easy it is. We know that this little zone here represents over 95% of the light bulbs. So that's pretty good as far as uh, most of the light bulbs fall between 72 and 124. Now, I'm going to change this question a little bit. And i got to clear this off. can hate to. Um, hmm. Maybe I can leave most of this. All right. I'm going to leave most of this. Uh, suppose we change the question. And I just want to show you how this works on the calculator. So, this time I say to myself, what percent has a lifespan of, say, 111 hours plus? So, in this case, what percent is... Hmm, I thought this was going to be a big saver by keeping. Anyway, what percent um, lasts more than... 111 hours. So that's how I'm changing the question. And just so you're not thrown by this, what are we talking about? Well, I guess I'll have to redo this because, doggone it, it's too much erasing. Erase just the right little bits. I'll just start fresh. Let's draw a picture. I always like to start with a picture. So there's our distribution. There's our 98. What are we talking about now? Well, we want to go up to 111. And look at what is this part here. What does that represent? And of course, this goes on forever. 
So that makes it kind of difficult. We want to see what percentage or what uh, proportion, what uh, probability is represented in this little wing. So we do it like this. We go normal distribution, formal CDF, and we start at 111. Now how far do you go? This goes on forever. Here's the tip. You just pick a big number because this gets so tiny, the graph gets so low to the x-axis, it's negligible. So you just throw in something big. You could throw in a million or 10,000 or something like that. It ought to do the trick. And then you've got your mean and your deviation, and you're off and running yet again. And if you calculate that, you'll find you get 0.15865, or roughly 16%. So that's not too bad. And that 16% uh, that survive 111 hours onwards. And one last uh, example, and then I'm going to stop. What if I said something like this? Um, if you had a shipment of 1,200 of these light bulbs, how many of them would, uh, would survive 80 to 120 hours? How many of those 1,200? I better write that. And this time, I'm not going to come sneaking around. I'm going to erase this, start fresh. Seems like it might be less work. Okay, so this time we're going to say we have a shipment of 1,200 bulbs. That is light bulbs as opposed to tulip bulbs. And uh, how many of those, how many actual bulbs, how many... Um, will last between 80 to 120 hours. So this time the question is a little different in that we don't want to know the percentage of bulbs that survive from 80 to 120. We want to know the actual number of bulbs of the 1,200 in this shipment. Well, if you think about it, it's a pretty easy question. First, we'll get the percentage or the proportion. So we go normal CDF, 80 to 120, 98, 13. And uh, you just go ahead, you do that on your calculator, and what you're going to get is uh, some kind of a decimal number that represents that proportion, okay, or that the probability from 80 to 120. And then we do this. We go times 1,200. So we're taking that proportion and expanding that to say of 12, or sorry, yes, of 1,200. You can do it all as one step on the calculator and you should get something around 1,046. Um, one other little tip before we stop for today. Um, in any math, test or quiz or situation, you want to show your work. And you might think to yourself with a question like this, how do you show your work if it's all done on the calculator? This is how. You write down what you put in. okay? Because then if you messed up something and you hit a wrong button, if you wrote it down, people can see what you were thinking and you're bound to do a lot better than if you just sort of wrote down the answer and your answer was wrong. So. That's how you show your work with statistics stuff.